welcome everybody and thank you for coming. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm Chris Bedford. I'm the director of the Rose Art Museum at Brandeis University. And um, I have the pleasure of being here with the beautiful Rosalind Drexler. And we Ooh, you need this. Oh, hi. I was going to say that up till now, my son kept trying to get me to go to the, the hairdresser, do something about my hair. I never had time. And now I look like this crazy artist <laughs> with this silver stuff coming out of my head. <laughs> anyway, I, I think it'll be OK. So, and you can see a photograph of um, Rosalind in another one of her primes up there. And uh, the, the Rose is very, very fortunate to be organizing Rosalind Drexler's first retrospective exhibition that opens um, in the spring at the museum. So I expect to see all of you there. Um, but this, well, this afternoon is about hearing from Rosalind. So I'm gonna proceed with, some, with a few leading questions and hopefully we can wind you up and you can, they can, you can tell them all about your work. So um, up here, you can also see, you can see the oh, image that's, that's right. on the screen oh, right there. That. Um, oh, is an that, incredible that's... painting, The Defenders from 1963. There's an interesting story with that, but there might be an interesting story with a lot of my work. I mean, it's a personal story about um, someone uh, dear to me got involved in um, drugs and stuff. And uh, to pay the lawyer, um, I had to give him this painting. So this painting did good right from the beginning. And then luckily I was able to uh, have the painting returned to me. So that's the painting you see there. Um, violence still going on. And um, what more can I say about it? It's right there. Could, could, you, <laughs> could you say a few words about the process that you use to make these paintings? The protest, the protest, the, uh, the progress, uh, anyway, what I do How is you make them. I find the image that, that interests me. And then uh, I imagine it on a, on a space of a certain size. And then I work around it on the canvas. And I order canvases of different sizes so that I can really see how the picture works on, on a certain uh, 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 space. And, um, you know, sometimes it's tighter, sometimes there's more space and bigger. It depends, and it also works emotionally on the uh, subject matter, uh, the, the size uh, of what you do. Because I've, I've also done a small things that, that had a very big feeling. And um, so that's, that's what I do with that. And then I just paint over it. Uh, it's as if I'm actually burying the image for future ex excavation. <laughs> you know, so uh, the original image is there and it's uh, being kept and saved for nothing really, but I, I work as, as the saver of this image by painting over it and uh, gives it another life and, and, and another skin. So, so I'm interested in the relationship between your work and say the history of appropriation in painting. And so rather than find an image and paint from it, you paint on top of things. Yes, I, I do. I, 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 I do that. I, I just, I use it as my material. It's like found object. Well, found object, I don't do anything on top of it. I just add and take away. And, um, but this is, I let it, in other words, I let it live or it lives more when I, when I uh, uh, paint over it. But the intent, the intent of what the image means is mine. And sometimes I'm surprised. I think I'm just doing um, a painting and it's violence or it's love. But then as I, as I look at it, as I work on it, uh, it, it has more meaning. It, it, it changes and um, it's, very, it's very changeable. So this painting, The Dream, uh, 1963, is hanging in, the, in Garth Greenan's booth, very nearby here. Um, so could you say just a few words about the content here, what you're doing? So the, the, the woman in the foreground at the bottom, and then the uh, rampaging gorilla whole, in the top section. I'm going to try to think about it now. It's a whole r romanticization, romanticization or something of, of uh, violence and also the, the, um, the love that a beast can have for a, a creature. This time the creature is a woman 
but, but still she's, she's certainly scared out of her wits as she doesn't understand this kind of beastly love that exists. But um, I think he's going to win over, and of course, uh, he's an action guy, this gorilla, and he's not a word guy, so he's, um, he, he's kind of tearing things up. And, uh, but his object is this woman who's terrified of him. And right now, that's all I can think about it, except that there's a lot of blue in it. <laughs> <laughs> I like the blue. So, but, but, but I, you know, another thing that interests me is, you know, there's a real preponderance of sort of hot, hot subject matter in your work. You know, violence, love, forbidden love. Yes, it's as if all this actually happens in the newspapers and magazines and not in real life. It's like one step beyond. It's as if the real thing happens just so it can be appropriated into a, an, a, a, a reminder. It's like a, a book of, of, of reminders, all of these things. And I take the reminders and I add my own, uh, my own uh, I impetus of what it means and what's going on. Um, so, and uh, sometimes I have like small ideas, like in this, um, I have the, the movie sprockets, I don't have the sprockets, but I have the movie action going on in the center. And then other people who are in this particular action on each side. There's the guy with the machine gun, and there's the guy who wants to know what's going on. He could be the boss. But you can write your own story. But meanwhile, I, I like the space very much. It doesn't close you in as you watch it. And uh, each thing has its own area and its own activity. So the element, and this is in the collection of the Hirschhorn Museum, I think. I could be wrong, uh, I believe yeah, I'm looking yeah. to. Yeah, yeah, no, you could be wrong, but this time. I think in this instance I'm you're, right. It's rare, right, few yeah. and far between, but I think yeah, I'm right. right. Um, but I'm looking at the element in the center, and it looks literally like a, uh, a film reel. And then again, yeah. there's this emphasis of blue on either side. So were you thinking about the legacy of American painting and trying to, you know, mid-century American abstract painting and trying to join that? to popular culture through this I, work? I never thought of joining anything. I mean, I was always an outsider and uh, laughing at my own ideas. And uh, I, I didn't really relate to, um, to other painters, other, even, even, even uh, other pop painters. Um, I was just relating to my own imagination. Although you have to be aware somewhere in yourself, hey, what else is going on around here? I mean, I'm, I'm not pure. But basically, I, I didn't wait for cues. I didn't wait for a cue from what other people were doing. It's interesting because um, I think one could make an argument that the most significant artists in the history of art are neither one nor the other. So um, Ellsworth Kelly, for instance, he isn't, a, he isn't a minimalist. He isn't a color field painter. He, he is just Ellsworth Kelly. He's taken parts of different sorts of idioms and he's made uh, his yeah, own. Yeah, I've seen a lot of his work, yeah. And so, so when I look at your work, I think an easy categorization is to say it's pop. But that's only one aspect of what you're doing. I think, I think Alloway uh, invented that term of pop. At, at one point it was called the New Realists, and then there was something else it was called. And, uh, but pop stuck because uh, it used uh, popular objects and things, modern day life uh, in, the, in the artwork. And, but it also uh, um, inf implied that it was cold, uh, that it was just the object, just the painting, and uh, without any emotional content, uh, that, that was a no-no. So I know um, certainly Lichtenstein was that kind of a painter. I love his work and <laughs> I really enjoyed his company too. We were in a Provincetown and his sons went fishing, brought the fish back, Roy, Roy made the dinner, we all sat down and ate, and then he showed us paintings that he made when he was a teacher. I said, and in my mind I think, boy, this, this guy isn't gonna go very far. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> this is terrible stuff, <laughs> you know, but he must have thought so too because he changed. He, uh, he did that um, Mickey catching uh, something, uh, f what? Look Mickey. Yeah. Look Mickey. Look Mickey. Look Mickey. Yeah, that was his first sort of wobbly beginning of 
what he was really. And uh, so I didn't want to talk about Lichtenstein. I miss him, but uh, then there was Andy, and, and Andy was t triple cold, you know, triple, quadruple cold. And uh, that was a pose because he's a very sensitive guy, very quiet. Um, his non-answers non and face, he was imitating Marisol. He, uh, I know he, uh, he and Ivan Karp decided that that was the way to be, it was very clever, to uh, mumble answers, to not respond, and to only live in, in your own troubled past. But Andy carried his troubled past with him. I mean, he always had his mother living upstairs. And, and that's, who, that's really who he answered to. And uh, he was mama's boy, uh, but who, who played, played the man of the world in a very odd way uh, downstairs. Um, uh, you know, I mean, everything to Andy was marvelous. I mean, it was actually marvelous and it was Marvelous when he couldn't think of anything else it could possibly be. It was always that. So I remember uh, we took some photomatic photos and we were walking, dancing down the street, and he stopped and it was at a, a newsstand. And he looked down, I think it was, a, I'm not sure which series it was. He did an accident series and he did the, um, we, uh, something, it was something like that. And he stopped and of course, what did he, he looked at, he said, Marvelous. You know, so it must have been, and I don't know if he bought the papers or anything, but uh, he, uh, everything, everything seemed to happen inside of him. Uh, it wasn't something he found, actually, even though he found it. Um, but once he, once he had seen it, he owned it. And they, he owned it in, in, in multiples. <laughs> and he let, had other people helping him with his multiples. I mean, uh, Jerry Malanga was a poet. He might still be a poet because he's one of the people who are still alive. And he, he originally helped Andy uh, with his um, uh, multiples, with his prints. So, so, and, and, and you, so you knew him relatively well. What did he think of your painting? Was he aware of your painting? And what did he think no, of it? No, no, Andy, Andy wasn't, nobody was, they weren't aware of my painting at all. They were aware of me as, um, as a former wrestler. And that's what Andy uh, uh, did a, a series of, of, of me in a wrestling pose. And um, th no, we don't, you know, when we got together, it wasn't really about art. I mean, it was all about kind of crazy stuff. Who was doing what and uh, the drugs and uh, the, the table we sat at at uh, Mickey's place and they didn't particularly go to the Cedars, Cedar Tavern. They went to Mickey's uh, place. And um, uh, the reason I, I didn't get in closer with them is um, I, I wasn't uh, interested in drugs. N not that I wasn't interested in them. It's, I was too busy. I mean, I was busy with family, and they were busy with each other. So I don't know, that, I don't know how sensible that is, but uh, to really be be in, in in that time was to, to actually live your life that way or unlive your life that way. And so so I furiously went through my slides trying to find um, the Andy Warhol album oh, of a oh, Mac yeah, Queen from 1962 yeah. here. So you're, so he's making this right around the same time as some of those um, early large scale collage paintings that we were just looking at. So um, how how did this how did this piece come to be? How did he, how did he approach you um, to you create know, this I object? Know, I don't know how he got a hold of it, but um, I found the uh, the original little little book. I don't know what it's called, <clears throat> with with the pictures of me in it like that. Um, yeah, oh, there there it is. <laughs> I I, ha I have I shouldn't apologize, but I do apologize to the sensitive people in the audience. <laughs> Uh, uh, this, uh, this, but this did happen. Um, I, I think I thought I was gorgeous. I was young and I thought I was wonderful. But, but when I was really young, I thought I was ugly. So, go figure. Anyway, um, I think it was my, my sister's husband who published these magazines, and that might be how he got a hold of, the, of my pictures. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I, I took them. Uh, but if you notice the old-fashioned garter belt, that was a real turn-on at one time. <laughs> it, I'm sure it's coming back. Maybe it just came back. <laughs> and, yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> it depends who's wearing it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So I know we're here to talk about your art, and I don't want to dwell on the wrestling, but it's a question that everybody asks. So um, could you say briefly how that happened, how you became a wrestler, how long it oh, lasted, oh, and, what, and, what was your, and what was your interest? And then we'll go right back to the fine look, art. Look, sometimes I've done things that I have absolutely no interest in, but other people have an interest in it. And um, I think that, that the wrestling thing is like a sadomasochistic example of modern life, <laughs> whatever. But uh, no, we lived in a neighborhood uh, in, the, in the West 40s in New York, um, and there was a, a gym there called Botner's Gymnasium. And that's where all the circus people worked out, the business people. I mean, there was one guy who came there all the time, and I, he, he, he worked on a, a one-wheeled bicycle, but his wife was on his head, upside down, with, fitted into sort of a donut contraption. So she's upside down on this, and this guy is doing his exercises on this uh, uh, unicycle, I suppose you'd call it. So that was going on. In front of the window, there was this, like, as, the length of this, at least, the length of this, uh, a, a mat. And then that's where the, um, <clears throat> the midgets and, and, uh, and dwarfs and stuff practice their, uh, their acrobatics. I mean, they did all sorts of amazing things right on that mat because they were part of the circus. And they do, that would go on all the time. Um, there was a lady who came in. <clears throat> she uh, 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 she was, must have been a former ballet dancer, but they hooked her up to something from the ceiling. She had special rice powder that she put on her face and a tutu and little ballet shoes. And she must have been about my age. And, and she would come there at least a couple of times a week. A couple of times a week she'd come there and she'd do her, her jetés and have supported in midair this, this woman. And that was going on in that gymnasium also. And then, and then there was me <laughs> in the middle of all of this with another girl uh, who uh, it was in a marching band, but she had aspirations to being a, a great wrestling star. And, uh, sh and she had me working out with her, and she wanted me to be introduced to the guy who was in charge of a troop of girls traveling across the country wrestling. And um, so I met him, and the audition consisted of me in a bathing suit at the Hotel Dixie, w walking back and forth, and they're looking at, and the, and the one question that the uh, guy asked me is, well, uh, will your husband let you, let you go on the road? Yeah, I, I said, yes, of course he would. I, I, I had no idea, but I, I could persuade him of anything. I thought it would be interesting, and I had no other opportunity to leave home. I mean, <laughs> this was my big opportunity. Uh, uh, so um, he said that he would get in touch with me as soon as there was another accident. So, I mean, because... <laughs> Because um, always, uh, there was always an accident on the road and the girl had to leave and then they'd need replacements. Uh, young fools, such as me. But so, so they called up and I rushed down south. I, I don't remember where. <clears throat> and when I got to the room there, there was one of the girls who was in the accident and had a tweezer, a tweezer in her hand and a gun. And she was pulling uh, broken teeth out of her gums, you know, like a real tough girl. Then another one's laying on their back, uh, laying on their stomach, and uh, uh, someone else uh, getting rid of the blackheads or giving a massage. Very professional stuff. And then they started to break me in by, um, I had to hold a pillow up to my chest. And then someone ran at me and gave it a good whack, you know. <laughs> and then I learned how to make the sound without the hurt. Just a, a, a real nice sound. And uh, before I knew it, I was out there being a baby face, uh, which is the one who's learning everything. And the baby face takes all, everything that uh, the other one has to offer uh, until it's time to retaliate. The audience goes crazy about the retaliate thing. 
because I haven't done anything for the entire match. I wasn't supposed to, but, but the audience is getting such a hate on for this person who's attacking me that, uh, you know, uh, that I had to retaliate. They, they showed me a couple of moves to make, and sometimes you get the referee tangled up into the middle of it, and they loved that. Uh, sometimes they threw me out of the ring and I landed in the lap of some, of the, some guy that was sitting there waiting for such an opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, it was really um, showbiz at its, at its most basic and also might, might be a low life at, at its midpoint. <laughs> So, so my trusty curatorial assistant who's working on the show told me not to ask you about wrestling <laughs> and instead focus on the paintings, but I, it was obviously know. a great question. So, I didn't know I was going to So ask I'm going to ignore this. another one of her directives, which is not, not to ask you about sport because you don't like sport, but it's a, but it's a reoccurring theme in the work. Um, so could you tell us about the, the attraction? The, I, I never had an attraction for sports. My husband has had an attraction for sports. And he had all that material laying around, and he knew all the people. And then, uh, like uh, Jack Newfield, who was a, a, a journalist, uh, all of these people were his friends, and they all got together. They watched all the fights at Jack Newfield, and it was a real, <clears throat> a real communal thing. And sometimes I tagged along, and sometimes I didn't. But um, I liked the pictures, the action uh, against the, you know, against the background. I move it around and paint it and do things with it. That, I was interested in that, and in the human interest stories uh, concerning uh, uh, athletes was very interesting to me. Um, although, you know, I, I saw through some of it, uh, the uh, false opportunity that uh, boxing gave to black, black people, and it was just uh, terrible, I thought. And also, football, um, I knew people were getting injured, and now it's becoming more and more known that they get concussions, so they don't watch out for their own. And um, so I, I had a, a beef with some sports. So, like your husband, I'm sports fixated, and so I'm naturally... sports. Uh, he, he used to play basketball himself. Yeah, oh, interesting. So, so, so looking at this painting, The Winner, from 1965, you can also oh. see it down there. Um, I mean, I think it's a masterful painting. I love the composition. Um, I love the fact that it draws on a kind of aesthetics that are inherent to sports. So the distribution of, you know, the very clear geometrics, the distribution of primary colors across the surface. You know, it's a critique on one hand, but it also assimilates the aesthetics on the other. And I think I'm very, I, I, it's, it's one of my f favorite of your paintings. I know, I like it too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, what I like in this is the silence of the moment. It's very still. And um, in my, my, my eyes, my feeling is there, there never is really a winner and a loser. Uh, art, sports uh, tries to make, make you believe that, yes, there's a winner and then there's a loser. But then you go on to another game or another bout and there's another winner or loser, and it's just like the word doesn't mean anything. But I, I did like the uh, the stillness of that painting, and like you say, the colors, uh, the composition. It was so quiet and so understated, understatement of a uh, a very uh, strong uh, 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 subject. So, perhaps contrary to the point that there are no winners and losers, there there is a distinct loser in the story attached to this painting, oh, this, the death uh, of, uh, and, uh, of Benny Kidd. And again, I think the painting is incredible. The, the, the six frozen moments that narrate the narrative of, of that evening and the, the, ultimate, the ultimate fate of the fighter. Yeah, the um, ref did not stop this man being beaten to death. I mean, and they, he was in a coma for what, number of weeks and then, um, and then he died, and then he died, and uh, his his wife was left to suffer. Um, yeah, yeah, it, this was a very sad story. And um, uh, what I did is I, I I I think maybe it's the first time anyone did the progression of of the story, uh, progression of the story from an actual 
uh, TV presentation. So um, that's what I that's what I did. So the shape of each one of those frames relates to the shape of the screen on the television, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the um, and the. I think one thing I'm struck by looking at it and thinking about the story is not only how present the painting feels to me formally now, it feels like a very fresh painting, but the subject matter, particularly race, exploitation, concussion, serious injury associated with sport, yeah, is so, so, well, yeah, you were interested in, you know, 1963, and we're as a culture only bec becoming deeply interested in now. So that's, it seems unusually present as an object. Well, in me and, and possibly a lot of people I knew, uh, the people who were my friends, very active uh, uh, politically in that way. And, and so, and politics were of interest to you at the time too, or the art, art, the art was your expression of politics? <laughs> oh, you know, uh, together, together, uh, like a painting was, uh, uh, a serious occupation, and, and, and politics was serious in another way, but it was also very social. The painting was very lonely, and uh, politics was very, very busy. So, um, yeah. so, since I have the microphone, and it gives me the liberty to explore some of the things I'm interested in in your work, I wanted to turn um, for just a second to the sculptures. So these are 1958, 1960. Um, I know they'll play a considerable role in the retrospective exhibition that the Rose is organizing. I've never seen them personally myself, but I'm struck by the fact that they precede the paintings by two, three years, maybe even more. Yeah, yeah, because um, I, uh, this is what I had around. I had plaster and I said, let's see what happens if I muck around with plaster. I mean, I'm beginning to sound like Bill de Kooning. He would say something like, yeah, I got to see what, I, what, I, what I'm doing now, and um, I think I put a little orange. Then he stepped back, and then he rushes at the painting again, and he says, okay. You know, I mean, that, that's his own criticism of his own work and how, how he proceeded. But um, in other words, I'm saying that the material was there, and I, and I found a way to use it. Um, actually, the first material uh, was all found objects. I was in Berkeley, California, and my husband was uh, getting a, is a, finishing a degree, and he's an artist. And um, uh, uh, so uh, we used to go to um, where people threw a lot of stuff away, and I'd get found objects and say, I don't have to go to a museum. My God, I can make my own museum. So I made a whole uh, found object museum in my house. You go from room to room. It was all this various objects that I made from what I found. And um, so that, that's the way I was working with the, uh, the enjoyment and fun of, of creating something new that I didn't know was going to happen. And so Wheel of Fortune from 1960, which may be my, again, having not physically seen them as image, my favorite of the sculptures. And I wonder how this related to people like Oldenburg and what they were doing and their use of yeah, comparable um, materials. Because I mean, my art history may be failing me, but I don't think so. This, these, these are roughly coincident with his work, yes? It is, a, it is a coincidence. And um, like we went to the store together that he created, created the store. and. Uh, uh, it was in, uh, my daughter was in his happenings, and so we were all conscious of each other, but in a very warm and friendly way. I mean, there was no idea that anybody was going to be famous or make it big. Everyone was just really going from, from the center of themselves and uh, let, let it just roll. Of course, Klaus is a fantastic artist, and um, his early work, I, I really love his drawings. He's a, terrific drawer. But it's true, and, and uh, he was working in plaster, and uh, Lucas Samaras was working in plaster, and, um, but it was always uh, different from, from each other. I mean, you can work in wood, and one, one thing can be look like a lost tooth, and then something else can be like a windmill, so uh, I don't know. Uh, so you, you're still painting, of course, and we'll get to some of the later paintings if yeah. we have time towards the end of this presentation, but sculpture, do you have the itch to return to three dimensions? 
I don't, I, no, I don't, ha luckily I don't have an itch for that. Um, but I think uh, I, I have that feeling, I think I do, to, uh, to make sculpture, but different kinds, I don't know how or what, um, of sculpture. You know, it's a shame that <clears throat> I couldn't keep moving and taking all of my sculpture with me. It got to be big and heavy. And a lot of the work I just left in empty lots and, and, and things like that. So um, I'm, I'm, glad that I have, I'm glad that I have something that I have. Um, it's, it's, it's representative and um, there. Maybe something will turn up someday. But I, uh, that, I, I stopped doing it maybe because it was, there was no room for it, physical room. I don't know. So the, what we have at the moment on the screen is a picture, an installation view from the Rubin Gallery from 1960, and I'm really struck by the pedestals. So were they your design, your conception? That was a mode of presentation you were interested in for your sculpture? Oh, no. Well, you, I, I have no idea, but I know you have to put something on top of something, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, I think you, you, you had um, good on pulses, good taste, because the, the more I look at the sculpture, the more I look at the pedestals, again, the more present they feel to me right now, as if they could have been made yesterday, which is always a, a good oh, sign. Oh, I, I see. Well, I, I didn't know what you were getting at. Um, uh, they were useful to me. There's Klaus looking at one of my garden things out of uh, plaster. <laughs> he seems to be pretty serious about looking at it. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, and just, and two more examples here: pink winged victory and white winged. I like color very much, and although the wings, uh, a wing of Samothrace, uh, victory wing, uh, is is okay if it's all white like that. Um. So, briefly, I think we could. I can say pretty conclusively that you are a renaissance woman of the highest order. You've done many, many things throughout your career as an artist. You've been a writer, you've been a playwright, um, you've been a visual artist. Thank you. And um, it would be difficult to give a total synopsis of that here, but, you, but, 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 your, but your work as a writer in particular has always struck me. Um, oh, so yeah. not only did you write the books, you designed the covers, which are the, have a kind of quickly iconic effect. And they're actually stacked in Garth Greenan's um, booth. And I notice people looking through them. So could you talk a little bit about your career as a writer and um, what life that has for you now? Oh, <clears throat> this is like a personal story. Again, um, I, I've always written. Um, in my soul, I feel like I'm a writer and I'm telling a story. Uh, the narrative is important. Actually, the narrative is important in my painting and, and always has been. Um, so um, the narrative that reminds me is that I, my mother and father used to have big fights. And um, they, 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 it disturbed me. And um, so one night I just wrote down as much as I could word for word the back and forth arguments that they had and I presented it to my father in the morning with his breakfast. <laughs> I said, this is what, it, what you did. This is how it sounds. And he took it, and, and he, uh, he got rid of the whole thing. We, we had dumb waiters in those days. And you, you used to put the garbage out and pull the strings, and then the dumb waiter went down. So all of my, my writing and, and my rebelliousness and my sadness went down the dumb waiter. So um, you're talking about uh, writing experiences. I also have an, uh, an art experience with my father um, that um, I was a very little girl. I don't know what age. And um, I, I copied something or traced something, and I brought it to my daddy. To, so, oh, look, daddy, look what I did. Look at this picture I made. And he, he looked at me, and he said, you didn't do that. If you did that... Why don't you do another one? Yeah, you know, and like he challenged me, and um, so I, I I I copied another one. <laughs> but it's still the the main thing that that he accused me of was not being original, uh, you know. So um, 
I felt very original and I felt very comfortable um, uh, uh, rescuing uh, a picture that I thought was really good. And that, that I'm just talking about young childhood experiences that may or may not be important anymore. I mean, people come and people go and then you miss them. What? So, so do you see the whole arc of your career as an artist as being coherent and contiguous? Because I, I, I I'll say from my perspective, when I look at the images, um, whether it's a play that you've written that's being performed, mm -hmm. or whether it's the cover of a book or the text contained in that book, or a sculpture, right. or a painting, there is a kind of intuitive continuity that I see from one to the other. And it's interesting to hear you say that you're telling a story, and I wonder whether that story spans all those media and is one thing. You're saying that you're saying that you think that there's a connection in, in all of my work that I'm retelling the same story. I think most people are retelling the same story, the one that sticks with them and the one that they haven't told or, or, or thought about in a correct way yet. Um, I think all writers do that and, and, and uh, all painters do that for sure. But some painters overdo telling the same story, I think. Um, but uh, I would say, if, if that is so, then I'm one with all of humanity because my concerns are love, violence, uh, continuation, that sort of thing, receding, like seeding, S-E-E-D-I-N-G, the world with uh, things you feel are important, wanting change, not in, and, and, and still suffering some things that will never be solved. So uh, that's good for work, that's good for art, is, uh, is, is to suffer with, suffer with the, uh, 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 with the life that uh, uh, still uh, is bothering you. And you see it everywhere, it's not your life, you see a war or a shooting, you relate to it personally. God, I wish I wasn't there, or wow, um, this is a terrible thing. And, but, uh, but also you're relating it to other things that hurt you in your life. So I think, I think pain is an important part of, of art also. Um, and I think it's interesting that, that Andy and, and, and um, uh, Lichtenstein uh, managed to have uh, no pain but only images of it. So, well, I think that's a pretty extraordinary sentiment. And um, I, think it's I think the commitment that's palpable in all of your work is one of the many reasons we're doing the big retrospective show. And I would say if more of that were palpable in the fair like this, it would probably be a better one, sorry. I'm probably not supposed to say that. But, um, you know, if, 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 all, if everything was subtended by commitments that deep, I think we'd be, we'd be looking at a totally different art world. So it's oh, yeah. commendable. Oh, I, lo I love the art world and I love the mistakes. And I love the fact that everybody rushes in and it's really an amazing time. <laughs> I think it's so great. Um, and also technical things that they're doing now with uh, all sorts of projections and interjections and um, whatever. And, and now you can make a three-dimensional uh, three uh, stuff comes right out of your machine. I think that's amazing. I'd like to try that. So I wanted to leave just a couple of minutes for questions, but, um, and the shameless self-promotion of our forthcoming exhibition can be the backdrop for the questions. Um, but just in closing, on the personal level, I, I would love to know what you think about this um, incredible upsurge in interest in your work. I think I'm correct in saying that you're 89 years old now, and uh, yeah. um, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of museums very keenly interested in you and what you're doing, I don't myself think included. it's because of my age, do you? I, I mean, know, I don't. <laughs> I'm just you. I, I'm simply <laughs> observing that you waited a while for it. Nothing to do with your age. Yeah, because a lot of people are disinterested in me because of my age. But um, anyway, uh, uh, what do I feel about this? Um, it, it's exciting. It's very exciting, and um, but uh, it, it's hard to believe anyway. In fact, I'm thinking, okay, when is it going to stop, and am I going to get home? You know, uh, but it's, uh, 
It's, it's, a, it's like what you read about, you know, it doesn't happen, but it happens to other people. So now I'm becoming like other people. And uh, luckily, uh, I'm the same person because it, it took so darn long, you know, for this to happen in this way that um, I'm really struggling to appreciate it. I'm struggling to realize, yeah, it's happening. But uh, I tell you the truth, so many people I love are, are no longer here to share it with me that I'm beginning to feel a little selfish to have it all to myself, you know. But anyway, uh, I'll have to bear up, I hope. <laughs> and for a while, too. Yeah, okay. So um, I think we have a couple of minutes remaining. So are there any questions from the audience? Donna? <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't prepared for the microphone. Um, Rosalind, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, in the context of the 60s and pop art, which was, for the most part, a very male-dominated movement, um, and or maybe you don't agree, uh, but the issue of power relationships in your work, because I think that's the thing that strikes me a lot, and maybe from the contemporary perspective, there's a couple of things, and there are many things, but there are several things I think that are speaking both to today and also spoke to the time back then, but maybe the, that time wasn't as attuned to a different perspective on power relations between men and women. Um, and I just wonder if you could I, comment I think, on that. Yes, yes, the point is that, uh, that that's true, now that you mention it, uh, all of these people were in quote, my friends, uh, they liked me a lot, knew I was doing something. For instance, all the power shakers, uh, power movers, uh, Castelli, uh, Ivan Karp, um, um, uh, 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 Henry Gelsailer, um, it was like, um, it was like a, a no, no women in and, and all men, men in and, and, and women out. But I, I didn't realize it because I was just a good fellow um, uh, just a, a really nice person, and uh, uh, and I appreciated them. So, and I really did. And uh, I never mentioned myself in in the company of other artists. I didn't bring myself up. They knew I was there, but uh, no, I didn't. Uh, oh, I didn't. A lot of people didn't. Even in Elaine de Kooning was married to to Bill. She was very strong, and she tried, but um, uh, was never uh, realized or regarded uh, on any level with the male artists doing the same kind of stuff. So um, I, I guess I, I was not aware of it, though. I accepted it because I was comfortable. I, whatever I was doing, I was glad I was doing it. I was so happy, and I had family and all that stuff and a husband who was very um, in the art world and, and loved and very intelligent. And I, and I let him be the loved and intelligent and creative artist and uh, just did what I did. I, I would go to my room, I secretly, I'd laugh, I'd laugh out loud <laughs> because I was the only one th that could appreciate or think my work was funny or good or outside of Sh uh, Sherman, I'd bring the work to him for a critique. And he could say one word, and I know exactly what he meant, and then I could work on, on the painting more. But outside of that, no. Even when I did an article on women uh, uh, choose art uh, for the Times, um, I thought that I was the one who had to write about them, but I wasn't one of them for some reason. So um, it's, it's interesting. But mostly with the men, um, no, I was never... Never one of that. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Maybe one more question, if anyone has one. Okay. Okay. I saw the uh, Rebel collection recently, um, their all woman show, and I, I was struggling to find some commonality among all this 100 women artists that they had there and didn't really find any. Um, so, what do you think in terms of modern women artists and how they've been different from the generation of the 60s? Well, 
there, there are so many. I mean, I, I can't take a full sweep of... Uh, this, I, I don't know what you're looking for in a work of art. See, I, I come to a work of art not looking for anything and finding it. So uh, what, what were you looking for? I mean, like the, the Louise Bourgeois, uh, pretty strong. Uh, Louise Nevelson, uh, pretty strong. And then there's... Um, um, I forget her name. I, I, I met her in Berkeley. She, a uh, strange woman, uh, did earth, earthworks, herself bleeding into earth. Mindyata. Yeah, Mindyata. Thank you. Uh, and uh, th there's another kind of a woman artist. So I don't know who you were looking at. Uh, what were you looking for? A message. You gotta get a Chinese cookie. <laughs> I think that's a good note to end on. And thank you so much for taking the time with us. Thank you.